Fleming is a former United States Marine Corps pilot with service in Vietnam from 1970 to 1971. He was trained in nuclear, biological, and chemical warfare, attended the Naval Justice School, and subsequently served as a non-loyal trial counsel and courts martial, and as lead investigator in criminal and aviation accident investigations. He was appointed to the FDA's Center for Devices and Radiological Health in 2006 and served as a panel member on both the Dental Products Panel and Circulatory System Devices Panel. He, he participated as an expert panelist on both the 2006 and 2010 meetings, evaluating the safety of dental amalgam. His work on the circuit Circulatory Systems Panel included evaluating the safety and effectiveness of endovascular and other cardiac-related devices. He retains his appointment as a consultant to the FDA Center for Devices and Radi Radiological Health, and he serves as the Academy serves on the Academy's Scientific Advisory Board. Please welcome Dr. Fleming to the podium. Our focus today is on uh, microwave radiation. The reason it's titled that, let me see if I can get back to that boy there. The reason it has this title is because if I'd put cell phone on there. I'd have probably been censored off of every YouTube, his tube, my tube, everybody's tubes, you know. So we want to talk specifically about the effects of cell phone radiation on medical devices, including the things that are in your mouth and the things that are inside your blood vessels. I would say, you don't have to raise your hand here, but there's probably at least one of you that has some kind of a medical device stuck inside of them somewhere. Yeah, there's a hand going up back there hips and knees and shoulders and ankles, and, uh, but a lot of blood vessel work, and that's what we're going to talk about today, the cell phone effects, cell phone radiation effects on those particular kinds of devices, and I think it'd be interesting to see what we come up with. This is very uh, a pioneering field. Nobody is really looking at this right now. Uh, there's plenty of work on cell phone radiation in the literature. I'll show you some sites later on, but for the most part, this sort of thing is not investigated. What effects cell phone radiation have on your health and in the presence of devices, is your health compromised? So are we ready to go back there? We're good. We're good. Okay, good. So. Kind of an interesting history. My own odyssey through life has been very interesting, as you can see. Uh, I've been involved in all kinds of different things. And one of the things that uh, has always interested me was the safety of the materials that we use every day in dental practice. I know the FDA is interested in it, but the FDA, speaking of the 10 years it took to come out with a regulation, what I can say about it is they're very risk averse, the agency, and I don't mean risk in patients. It's the risk of their reputation. So it took them 10 years to produce this regulation that you saw in February of last year, which restricts its use in certain higher risk populations. My wife once said to me, you know, honey, it's <clears throat> with all this kind of experience and the ideas you come up with, you must surely be outstanding in your field, you know, and I said, thank you, honey, that's the sweetest thing you've ever said to me, you know, and this is what she actually meant. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I was standing in the field, it's a blur, I don't know if that's my field or if that's even me, but that's, that's the deal. So we got to keep our perspective when we talk about these things. We've heard a lot of things about sleep, breathing, we seem to be in a generation of I can't breathe, you know, so it's so much going on with breathing and or airway, and it's a huge topic, and one which the Academy rightly has dedicated its resources to investigating. So this is a, the most expensive picture ever taken in human history, and I'll show you why here. That's Earth from 3.4 billion miles. Have any of you ever seen this before? It was taken by the Voyager spacecraft on its way out of town. So that's what the Earth looks like. All the stuff we're dealing with here today and all over the planet is right there in that tiny blue dot. Three, so we need to keep our perspective about these things. We need more of an integrative approach toward understanding the relationship between devices, health, airway, all these things. Okay, so these are two principles I generally go by. 
learning how to think is a far greater challenge than simply settling for what to think. Most of us, the things that we believe are what somebody else told us, and so we have to think for ourselves. This academy is excellent at thinking for themselves. And obviously, they're not interested in what you and I believe, only what it can prove. So this is the goals that I'd like to try to accomplish today in the time that we have. Uh, we want to look at what microwave radiation might do to medical device integrity. There's a lot of similarities between oral and endovascular devices that contain metals in particular. And we want to just, I want to show you some of the devices that are commonly used and your patients will have them inside of them. What I'm not going to be dealing with are joint implants. It's too broad a subject, but the metals are quite similar, which we'll see here in a minute. So here's the four major food groups of the average adult. Drugs, medical devices, caffeine, and sugar. All right? Don't you agree? I mean, this is... This is now, we also can, could consider these comorbidities, couldn't we? Meaning that if you have a lot of drugs on board and you're loaded up with metal and you drink a lot of coffee and you consume sugar in whatever form, that these are comorbidities to illness. So you can't consider airway or anything else unless you consider the whole person. I'm going to show you a guy in a minute that's classic that you'll see in your practices all the time. <clears throat> so this is the microwave spectrum. You've seen this before sometimes. That arrow is pointing to the area that we are interested in because this is the stuff that you've got your face in all day long, okay? You're taking a bath in this every day. So this is the area we're interested in. Right in that little deal right here. We're not interested in you sticking your head in the microwave and cooking it. I'm only saying what's happening when you get exposed in this range of energy right here. So this is... Uh, a history of 4, 5, and 6G here. Uh, this 5G stuff is what they're touting on you now. Very short wavelength. There's literally a transmitter on every light pole in the town to get you the signal. This right here is the stuff they're working on right now, and the Chinese are working on 7G. Okay, so this is sort of the history of the Gs. As you can see, they allow more and more data. You get down here to 5G, you can talk to your mama, you can watch Netflix, spy on your daughter, and watch a football game at the same time. Okay, so, and the speed is remarkable. Okay, so this is what 5G will do. And this is the same stuff that's coming out of your routers. And, and out of these transmitting towers that are installing 5G everywhere. So this, these are just a few of the characteristics down here. This data speed is remarkable here. A lot of stuff uh, flying through your house. Okay, so, so this is a Venn diagram. I love these things. I, use them, I like to use them when I'm doing FDA work and things like that, where we look at the things that we're interested in. These could be very different things, but we've got these devices here, we've got the 2 to 5G stuff here, and we have these effects that we are not sure what they are. So maybe 2G doesn't have anything to do with it. Maybe the device itself has effects, and we know that they do. They're designed to do things. But there are health effects from these devices as well. On the other hand, it could be that the there's a health effect from 2 and 5G. The evidence is very clear that there are health effects from 5G and under radiation. But we still don't know about the devices yet. So we just do this deal. And there's our little buddy in the center there where we look at the interaction of these three different things for the purposes of our discussion here. Venn diagrams are very helpful to help you think about things. <clears throat> so what's the big deal here? It's a concept called microwave catalysis. 
which is the ability of uh, cell phones and other microwave radiation to uh, enhance a catalytic reaction in the tissues and around metals. We're interested specifically in pulsed, non-ionizing microwave poration. What does that mean? Cell phones energy pulses. It, it isn't a steady signal, it's pulsing. So what you're going to get here, and it's non-ionizing. It is not stripping electrons off. It's disturbing tissues in a different way. So the bottom line here is that you're going to see an enhanced release and uptake of these toxic metal ions and device particulates via these different routes. We already know that mercury comes out of amalgams. Everybody knows that. Uh, we're going to look at that just a little bit here. This is from Dr. Meg Sears, who is a friend of mine, who has uh, done most of the seminal work on membrane disruption from cell phone radiation. These are a few of the very interesting things that she's worked on. What I'm most interested in are these boys right here, electroporation. This is one of the ways in which microwave energy is used to treat tumors. It has positive uses, but it causes the pores of the cell to open allowing for the ingress of medication. Here, synergism, toxic metals, lead, which means that if there's metals released as a result of the microwave exposure, then now we've got to deal with things like lead, mercury, nickel, and other metals. So there's a radar. That's where we used to get the radar range from. That's where the name comes from. Guys used to stand in front of this thing to keep warm and cook their lunch, you know? And so this is the classic cell phone tower. God, this stuff looks just like Rolaids, doesn't it? Because by the end of the day, you're going to need a case if you're around one of these things. But this is an older style tower. There's one with clothes on. Huh? They're all over the place. They're everywhere. They think they're hiding something here. Yeah. Notice the tree right here? Okay. You'll see this phenomenon anywhere near a cell tower where there's uh, trees like this. You will see de a denuding of the leaf material on the tree here, depending on the direction of the signal. This is what a 5G transmitter looks like. They're strapped to just about every pole. In, in, in a, well, it's coming to a neighborhood near you. So you're going to be buzzing. This stuff's going to be buzzing through your house here very shortly. These are the devices we're interested in, of course. These guys aren't off the hook either. This is actually a router. That, of course, most everybody in this room knows what these boys are. They are Bluetooth devices, but they do operate at frequencies which can be harmful. This is how they test these things. They got this gel-headed guy here, <clears throat> and they stick the phone up against it and turn the phone on, and then they measure the amount of energy going through the head. Now, each manufacturer, Samsung, Apple, has a different distance from the head that they, will, uh, they, that they require. But the fact of the matter is, devices, we just, people don't use devices just like this. You know, this is not what they typically do. So let's take a look at some of this stuff. Here's your little girl here with that cell phone mashed up against her face. Um, let's take a look at what that might be doing to her. This is a picture of a bone marrow in the skull of a child. This is showing the uh, effect of the uh, microwave. Now, this is a heat signature of sorts. But it's not the same thing as ionizing or non-ionizing. I mean, it's, it's, it's still a non-ionizing effect. This is a guy that's used the cell phone for 15 minutes. Anybody do thermography here, you'll recognize this pattern. This guy's face is lit up. Okay. Ah, okay. So here, here she is, sort of a very elegant face plant into the cell phone here. And she's laying on her side all of the wonderful things that induce sound and complete 
sleep. I'm not sure what this girl is doing. I think she's waiting for the call from the guy from India, her new best friend that uh, calls her every day, reminding her of her expired car warranty. So that's probably what she's, that's probably what that girl's doing there. It's, <laughs> that's what she's waiting for is whatever, you know. Okay, girls. No, I don't think you're going to want to do this. I'm not asking for a show of hands. I'm just suggesting that they actually make clothing to house that phone in that location. Don't want to do that because you might wind up with one of these uh, very extensive carcinomas of the breast right along the antenna of the telephone. We're going to get to medical devices in a minute. Okay, here's our buddy here with the thing in the pocket. We're going to come back to him later. But you've got a bunch of metal in your chest. If you've got wires in here, a pacemaker over here, a stent right there, or some kind of a heart device, this is not a good idea. Okay. Oh, okay. This is butt dial here. There she is, right there. This is where that butt dial thing came from, I guess. Maybe the next time you uh, get a butt dial, you should listen in. You'll find out what she really thinks about you. But, um, oh. <laughs> Sorry, ladies and gentlemen. I know where that boy's going to wind up. And I want to tell you without a shadow of a doubt that cell phones are not sex toys. Somebody somewhere has tried it, but don't do that. That is not good. Now, back to this just a second here, okay? So if you've got a uh, hip implant here or here, or if you've got an aortic stent here, or if you have back hardware in your back, no, don't do this, okay? So now we're down to kitties. So we just put little Joey in the, in the seat there, and we put his little iPad right in there, and we give him a bottle of apple juice, and we just turn the little button on there, and he sits there for two or three hours while mommy goes out and gets her nails done. Now, this is my grandson. I have 11 grandchildren, and I do not want... I've got five daughters and 11 grandchildren. I do not want to see that. Now, she gave me permission to use this because they're having a hard time controlling this. I mean, look at that kid's face. I mean, he's down in that sucker. He's got it planted on that screen. And he uses that thing... Some of the kids use these things two to three hours per day on their developing brains. We talk about airway. Okay, I'm good. But that has got to contribute to something developmentally. Okay, so so here we are. Here's Let's get into the medical device business. Here's our old friend Amalgam. This is an interesting study which showed that the Wi-Fi devices uh, increase the mercury release from amalgams. We all know that they do it you can shine a flashlight on an amalgam and it'll release mercury out of it. I mean, these things are very uh, prone to release their contents. One of the things we learned at FDA when we were dealing sort of in the backwoods with this before we came to panel meetings was my belief that the most efficient route of absorption is through the tooth. Okay, so anytime you put a restoration in a tooth, we don't want to ignore the intratooth absorption into the bones surrounding the roots. Murray Vimy's study and all uh, revealed that very clearly some years ago. So this is a, a real nice one. There's more where that came from. I'm trying to keep this as straightforward and clinical as I can. Okay, so orthodontic brackets. We now know that cell phone radiation releases nickel at a, a rather alarming rate from orthodontic appliances, and there can be reactions to those right there. So now we've got a basis to say, well, now wait, if orthodontic brackets and braces can do it, 
maybe if there's medical devices that contain the same materials might also be subject to the same kind of force. Okay, so here we go again. This is a very interesting study having to do with uh, zinc oxide and titanium oxide and the effect of microwave radiation on uh, the release of particulate. These things behave like antennas in the presence of uh, cell phone radiation and other types of microwave intense radiation. They behave just like they intensify the effect in the bone immediately around the implants. Now here's our guy here. Okay, take a look at this dude here. Okay, this guy is a tow truck driver, okay? And he wears a Bluetooth headpiece all day long, waiting for the call, okay? He's on four blood pressure medications, uh, two cholesterol-lowering medications. He has two hips and a shoulder, artificial hips and a shoulder. Um, and he calls the hospital and said, I can't breathe. Okay, so uh, he came down with COVID. He survived it and is doing quite well, but not without a two-week stay in the hospital and intubated. Okay, so my question is, you take a guy like this <clears throat> or any of your patients, you've got some like this, all of you do, you got to figure out what you're going to do. These root canals look great, don't they? Just fantastic, you know? All these different metals in here. Uh, about one half of these metals were nickel-based alloys, we were able to uh, ascertain. So let's get into a little bit of the device metals that we're interested in here in our discussion. Nitinol is a very interesting, you've all heard of this, I'm sure. Uh, nitinol is nickel and titanium. Look how much nickel is in that. It's named Nickel Titanium Naval Ordnance Laboratory. That's where it comes from. And I might add, you might think I'm a little nuts, but the real controversy around this whole development of this metal uh, has a little bit to do with ufology. You might say, oh boy, Fleming, we're out. You know, but this is very interesting. There was a lot of uh, very interesting... Um, stuff about this shape memory alloy. Night and all, you know, you can just, it'll spring right back to its original shape, and this is very handy when it comes to medical devices. This is stainless steel, typically, of the type that's used in, like, stainless steel crowns and other stainless wires and so on. I've got the arrows here for chromium and nickel. Pretty good content. And considering that about 40% of the population has a, an allergy to nickel, you want to be careful about how much of that stuff's floating around. So 316L, the difference between that and this is the carbon content. This is what's used in medicine, in stents and things like that. So there's the stainless steel crown, of course. Anybody remember this one? If a dentist did this to my child, um, I'd shoot the guy and roll him in a ditch is what I would do. You know, but this was uh, a very uh, fascinating case. Uh, the whole thing with this pediatric clinic, they were putting stainless steel crowns on every tooth in these kids' heads. Now, you want to get a cell phone near that one? I don't think so. So let's look at the endovascular devices a little bit in the time that we have. <clears throat> you can see the different criteria for these things. We've got those that are just designed to open up arteries. We've got some that are uh, repair damaged vessels like aneurysms and so on. Entrapment devices to capture clots that shoot up from the leg. And then we have these, this, what you call percutaneous closure of intracardiac defects. We'll get to that in a little bit here. So this is one of the other products used very commonly in medical devices. Anybody recognize that one? That's Gore-Tex. A lot of fluorine in there. The issue for me is, 
is any of this stuff cleaved off? You know, I had an FDA guy tell me one time, I was up there with Boyd Haley and a couple other guys, we were having a meeting with the FDA people, and there was a scientist there, the guy was really one of the most condescending, arrogant dudes I've ever met in my life, and he said, well, if you're so concerned about stuff that's coming off these products, fillings and all that stuff, you could do mass studies. And I came so close to telling the guy, I said, look, I'm not Catholic. You got any other ideas, you know? <laughs> but I've thought better of it because I wouldn't have gotten my free potato chips. So, um, but anyway, Gore-Tex used all over the place in medical devices, hernia repairs and all the rest, okay? So this is a, a study that investigates a little bit of the potential to degrade products like Gore-Tex. Good read. It's there for you to read. There'll be other references later on. Okay, I'm going to spend just a little bit of time on this one here. This is a triple A stent, okay, aortic aneurysm stent. See the nitinol struts with the little spikes on the end right up there? And then it's got the uh, PFTE, the Gore-Tex fabric on it. If you don't remember anything I've said to you today, any man in this room over the age of 50 needs to be screened for an aortic aneurysm, aneurysm. An aneurysm is what took the life of Mike Ziff. And there's no reason for you to be alive one minute and dead the next. Very simple ultrasound scan of the abdomen and the chest. This thing is stuck in through uh, the femoral arteries. There's the one side of it that goes here, and then they dock, they go through another artery and dock it in there. And this thing goes from here all the way down in here. And it has to be followed up annually, as opposed to going in and chopping the artery out and putting in just a tube. Okay, so if I don't remember anything else, get screened. Uh, about 30% of the males over the age of 60 have an aneurysm of some form. About 30% or 40% of people who have aortic aneurysms have aneurysms behind the knee. Okay, popliteal aneurysms. I'll show you a stent for those in just a minute. So uh, you need to be screened for it, and it's, it's, it's just important that you do that. This is a type of stent that's uh, platinum chromium. Remember what we said about metals and microwave, you know. So this one has a polymer on it that's eluding a drug, which is designed to keep it from restenosing. These are platinum chromium struts as opposed to nitinol, Boston Scientific. Here's another one that doesn't have the drug on it. The decision to use a drug-eluting stent versus a non-drug-eluting stent is strictly in the hands of the cardiologist that's doing it. This is the type of stent that would go in a popliteal artery right here. See this very, and the thing is, when you put it behind the knee, the problem is flexing your knee and cutting circulation off. So they have to build these stents where they won't collapse like this. This is a nitinol PFTE stent. And this is the stuff they're putting in your body, you know. Now, this is a guy who basically had a severe reaction to a nitinol stent very allergic to nickel. Remember, we said that nickel can be released from these devices, even though it's in the leg. I get that. But there's still an issue. He already had an existing allergy. So that's a picture of them going in and removing the stent that was in there. That's his artery section that they took out. There's the stent right there. Totally clotted included. If you get a clot formed inside of one of these aneurysms and it shoots down, you, you will lose your leg from the knee down. So these stents, they usually bypass these. But this was a very interesting case. This is a carotid stent, 
that goes in the carotid artery. This one has an EPTFE. That's an expanded version of it where they've stretched it a little bit here so that they put this inside. I'll show you how they do that. And they just run it up in there and expand it. It's right here in the neck. See, you're going to sit there with your cell phone like that. I don't think you should do that. That's what one looks like that didn't work. Way that what the surgeon has to do is cut the artery open, split the stent, and core out all the junk. I know you just had lunch. You're all right with that. Yeah, okay. All right. So, yeah. Okay. This is a classic coronary stent, stainless steel. Again, the dependency on drugs or not depends on the operator, the nature of your lesion. If it's highly inflamed lesions, they'll usually put a drug eluting stent in there. This is the nickel containing stent. Studies have clearly shown that nickel escapes from these devices and may be responsible for a good bit of device failure. So uh, now this is a, another study that talks about having to go back in to a coronary artery and take a stent out because it failed for some reason or another. We don't know the reason. There it is. What you're looking at is actually, this is all fat and garbage around the, the artery was totally blocked. The only time they will go in and do this procedure is if there is a bypass operation going on at the same time. They'll go in and they'll cut this artery open and take this out, restore some degree of patency to it. But you see that stent right in there. This is a vena cava filter. Look how often nitinol is used. It's used all the time. 55% nickel. Okay, so this is one that, uh, that can be retrievable. This one stays in there for people that have chronic DVTs. So let's move to intracardiac devices and take a look at those. You're going to be amazed at the similarities. Again, here's, here are the septal defects that we're interested in. I think you'll find something to be very interesting about these repairs. This is the most common one used, Amplatz or closure device. You may have had patients who have had strokes. This is used to treat what we call cryptogenic stroke, where they get a stroke and they don't know where it came from. Most of the strokes come from two places. They come from a hole between the right and left heart, and they come from the left atrial appendage. I didn't even know what that was until I went to work with the FDA. We'll explain that to you in just a minute. This thing goes between the, the walls, and they just cinch, cinch it up and pinch it off, and it endothelializes. Now, here's the two things they treat with this. Remember, we were dealing with migraine in the other room over there earlier. Okay, so isn't it interesting that migraine with aura can be treated by closing the patent foramen ovale? as long as the patient has migraine with aura. So patients with migraine with aura are more likely to be stroke victims than the average population. That the thinking is that right there, that defect. About 40% of us uh, retain an opening here in, throughout our lifetime. Unoxygenated, oxygenated blood mix. And that may be very well what triggers the hypoxic migraine phenomenon. So good to remember, the only time they'll put one of these boys in here is if you've already had a stroke. Isn't that nice? So again, now here's another one that's really amazing, this thing here. We reviewed this back in 2012, I think. This is made by Boston Scientific. Look at this sucker. I mean, it's... Uh, it's an elegant thing. It's got these little sutures that hold the metal to the fabric. And it's night and all stuff down in here. Have you ever wondered how these guys figure this stuff out? I, I can, it's me. I'll tell you what, maybe he went to the, maybe he went to the aquarium and said, hmm, you know, I actually know exactly how this guy did this. It was his grandmother's lampshade. 
Okay, so very elegant device. It is used in a couple of instances. AFib stroke prevention. Here is the second most common, or perhaps the most common, reason why people have strokes when they're in AFib is because right there in this little left atrial appendage, everybody has one. They stuff that boy in there, deploy it, and then it epithelializes and closes this off. Because the stroke, what happens is it goes right out of here, right, you know, it's, it's, it's going right out to points distant. So, Failed anticoagulation, there's a lot of uh, patients that have AFib and they just, they clot up in here. So if you ever go in for an ablation, some of you have probably had an ablation in here. There you go. Uh, me too, by the way. They, uh, <clears throat> afibrillation is, is a huge problem in your patient population and it's a real problem with the aging population. But again, here's another device and it's right there. Okay, so these, just quickly, let me show you a couple other things here with aneurysms. These are the brains, aneurysms. You can see these platinum coils that they put in there. There's the coils that they stuff in that aneurysm intravascularly. These guys are amazing. They go up in there and push that stuff into that aneurysm, and it irritates it and epithelializes the aneurysm. It keeps it from blowing up. These are some clips that are, have to be done with the open skull. You know, they go in and clip the aneurysm at its neck. Uh, a lot of people have these. Again, cell phone, you know. This is some of the alloy they use for that sort of thing. Here again, nickel, all, the, all these metals show up here again. Let's look at some artificial valves. This is the uh, aortic valve system. Now they can put every, they've got everything on a stick now. They just put it on a catheter and run it up in there and, and deploy this thing. Here we see nitinol again. This is bovine tissue enclosed within this valve here. These things last about 10 years before you have to go in and they just go right inside that one and put another one in it. They don't retrieve these. They just put another one right inside of it and deploy it. I'm sorry? Nope. You can't get that metal part out. That sucker is there. It's epithelialized. The only way to get it out is open surgically. Now, this is a pulmonary valve. You know, in our right ventricles, there's a valve that goes out to the lung. Okay, this valve is often defective at birth. And so um, here we have the situation where these valves can be installed on a catheter, sutures, another bovine, usually from the a jugular of a cow, and platinum meridian struts, gold brazed, and boom, in they go with it. If that fails, they go right down the center and pop another one in it. Some patients, before they develop this valve, basically were condemned to multiple surgeries, sometimes once every 8 to 12 months, to open the chest, put a new valve in. This is the, the deal with the Melody. This is uh, Medtronic. Very good company, actually. This is how you do it. Go right in the right side there. Deploy that baby. There it is right there. They deploy it inside the other valve and just squash it out. This is not intravascular. Uh, I thought I would mention it for a couple of reasons. This is uh, some of your patients with uh, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease will have these things installed. These are little devices that are coated with silicone. Nitinol struts, here it is again. They shove it in the bronchial tubes here and it prevents overinflation of the lung. They tell me when you put a stethoscope to it and the patient breathes it sounds a little bit like little ducks in there literally so that's what the device it can be retrieved now why is that important well many women many men have silicone implants so maybe you need to think twice before you stick these things in there okay so pacemakers quickly there you go 
That's just one of many different kinds of pacing. There's all sorts of reasons to pace. These are inserted through a vein into the right ventricle, typically. There's the little active end of it. Titanium case, polyurethane, lead coating, not lid. <laughs> okay. Look at that boy. Some of them have these little spikes on the end so that it embeds in the heart tissue there. My dearest college friend died on the operating table trying to get these out. How would you like to be sitting in the waiting room? Husband's going to be out in about 40 minutes. Suddenly the guy comes out two hours later and says, I'm sorry, he's, he's gone, we couldn't. Yeah, so that's different types of leads. This is actually leadless pacemakers now. They've got these little guys, look like torpedoes, and they just put them in there, and they can retrieve these. They've got little batteries all inside of them, and they can be read by an external device. So, here's the latest on pacemakers. Don't get a cell phone anywhere near those suckers. And these are the reasons that they say, here's Apple's uh, statement uh, on iPhones. I don't know if you've ever seen anybody's defibrillator go off in their chest, but it'll knock you right to the ground. Knock you right out of your chair with those things go off if you, if you happen to be talking on the cell phone next to a guy who's got one. Okay, so... And they're usually put here, right here. So we're going to look at our guy again. Now, now we've got our, our, our boy here with a pacemaker right there, sternal wires. His chest may have been split open and wired shut after bypass. He may have stents. God knows what. No. That's what sternal wires look like. They're 316 stainless. They don't have memory. That's the last thing you need in a wire closing your bone up is, is spring it open, you know. Don't want that. So, in my view, microwave radiation and specifically cell phone radiation uh, serves as a catalyst and it intensifies the, uh, uh, in the tissue. Whoops, I got a little, a little fat ahead of myself there. Sorry. There we go. The untoward effects of the systemic metal and device breakdown products, I mean, you, you can do your own homework on this, but we got a problem with cell phone radiation. Uh, I wish I had more time to develop the science. I'm going to show you some resources at the end. And these are the summary of the potential effects as I see it. You got these metal ions released here and device structural contents. Uh, the distributed metal ions. The big thing is the cellular permeability. Metal-induced toxicity. And reduced resistance, secondary to metal-induced immune compromise. And then, of course, you can have device failure. There's the uh, standard that the FDA uses to regulate. It's not the precautionary principle. If you think you got a problem in your office, you can elect as a practitioner not to do it. But they're not regulating based on what you think. Remember, it's only what you can prove. And unfortunately, most of us in this business of amalgam and all the rest of this stuff are put in the position as clinicians to suddenly become scientists and to prove without a shadow of a doubt that the FDA needs to make a change. And there you are, standing before a panel, giving your testimony, and they're just, you know, are they listening? They think if they're listening, they've done their job. So, there's that. Now, this is our old buddy Jeff Shuren, who's in charge of CDRH and who was in charge of this latest regulation and so forth. This is what he thinks back in 2018 about cell phone radiation. Have we seen this sort of thing before? I think we have. It's always the evidence is not sufficient. It's always that. This is the precautionary principle. 
as I see it, most of you would take steps that you thought were reasonable on a precautionary basis no matter what the FDA or anyone else was telling you. So how are we doing on time here? It's 4.50? About 10 minutes? Okay, so this is a supplement that I added for you, which... Uh, plays a little bit off of cell phone radiation, but it is an area of great interest today, nanotech. This is what's really going on in the world of medical devices right now. Uh, it's part of what I'm having to work on a little bit. Some of the devices that are out there for delivering medications and delivering uh, diagnostic tools intravascularly and so forth. So take a look at this guy right here. This is what Pfizer's vaccine looks like. Okay, this is a medical, some people say it's a medical device. It's actually a completely biologic product which, is, which contains the, the target payload, which is this red stuff in here, which is the mRNA. And then on the outside here we have these little proteins that know where to take it. This is basically simply a FedEx truck. It's just delivering it to a certain site. I said, well, what's this got to do with cell phone radiation? Well, if you have a lot of microwave increased permeability, what would be the effect indirectly on something like this? So this is how it does it. It attaches to the cell wall invaginates and gets inside and then it just kind of coughs up its contents inside the cell like that. This is in my view any nano carrier can be considered a medical device because it's using an entirely artificial system. Although this product is largely biologic, uh, the, the vaccine itself, I've, I've written down here for you what the nature of this these vaccines, these mRNA vaccines are. My main interest is the effect of cell phone and microwave radiation on the ability of the cell to take up more of this stuff than it's supposed to. Okay, And we really don't even know what the mRNA is doing in there after it does its thing. This is the ingredients of the Pfizer vaccine. I almost had to kill to get this. But they don't, that's the known components of it. But the fact that it's delivered in an entirely artificial medium is similar to what the FDA is doing in the medical device division, which is looking at ways to carry drugs, information, and convey that to the cell. That becomes a medical device, in my view. So that's what, that's probably what Pfizer's a per particle looks like. It's got this lip liposomal membrane. It's coated in um, <laughs> antifreeze uh, like compounds so that the immune system does not recognize it and it gets into the cell, opens up and coughs out the, the contents. There's really debate on whether this is a classic medical device or if it is a simply a biologic there's a debate within FDA about how this should be regulated going forward. This is SARS-CoV-2, of course. Notice how similar it looks to that. And this is what I'll say about it. Is the, remember, the concept that I made earlier, the host cell main membrane permeability issue. This comes from a very excellent piece here talking about cell phone radiation and the ability to affect not so good things. This is uh, Mike Ashner, who's, you know, all of you know Mickey. Uh, Mickey's participated in this paper, which he talked about toxic metal exposure as a possible risk factor for COVID. He did not include in the study nickel or cell phone radiation but it's an excellent article on the role of metals. So if you're getting metals released from these de devices and products, we know what's happening. It is something that we really need to keep our mind on. So 
This is a, uh, the way in which a tumor cell is being considered to be treated using zirconium oxide, the same stuff that's used in implants. Tiny nanoparticles containing different agents conveying it into a tumor cell in the presence of microwave radiation. Isn't that interesting? There you go. What do you think of that? Hitachi RFID microchips. These things have antennas in them. All right. It's called Rifid Powder. They can spray it. They can shoot it in your arm. They can do anything with this stuff. And it can be embedded with a massive amount of data. Now, the positive side of this is that if you have specific information embedded in these things, then you can target cells with certain medications and treatments that are important for a cure. But, as always, like a 45 record, you know, you've got the good song on one side and the bad song on the other. The bad song is, I don't want that stuff anywhere around me. Okay? Whether it's in the atmosphere or whatever. Hitachi. God, those guys are good. These are some of the resources for you. The one that's really amazing is this guy down here. 31,000 papers on electromagnetic field radiation and its effects. That's going to keep you busy for quite a long time. Uh, this is from EH Trust, uh, the group with Deborah Davis and Meg Sears, who uh, it's a wonderful compilation of research there, risk to health and well-being and so forth. This is more of the health effect issue. And then thermal and non-thermal effects. This is another very good, and this is another summary up here. So, And that, my friends, is the end.